Welcome in to EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. Joining me today is Adam Phillips, EP's Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy. He's a CFP, Certified Financial Planner, and a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. For the year, the NASDAQ's up 16.7%, the S&P 500 up 18.6%, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up a nice 13.6%. Adam, let's talk about what we saw last week because it seems like it may be the new norm. And that sounds interesting from an investor's perspective. We had a bad Monday. We had a bit of a correction going and then it stopped and we had a rebound week. Is the 5% down the new 10% down where the market goes down 5%? That's our buying signal, buy-in on the dip. What are we feeling here? You know, it, it sure would be nice if that was all that we needed to worry about. I, I think that's definitely what we've seen. I mean, we still haven't seen, I, I guess on an intraday basis last week, we got to that 5% down, but on a closing basis, we still haven't gotten there since uh, I believe it was uh, early, uh, it was October of, uh, of last year. So it's, it's been some time. I still think it's, it's coming at some point. You know, we, we will eventually have that more significant drawdown. So far, so good, though. I mean, there's still enough uh, cash on the sidelines. Uh, in, investors are still uh, anxious to use those opportunities to buy that dip. And, and so for now, it, it's still working out. I think part of it is, is really uh, that uh, if, if you're not invested in stocks these days, where are you going to go? I think it goes back to that whole Tina, there is no alternative story that's really providing the support to stocks on, on these down days. Seems a little ludicrous because this is going to sound silly. Back when we were younger, 5% corrections happened all the time. Now they seem like rare events. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about a tailwind, a lot of money on the sidelines. A lot of consumers have cash that we will spend, but let's talk about some of the headwinds. The higher interest rates caught my attention last week um, that we could be swimming upstream, so to speak, making it a little bit more difficult in the coming weeks on interest rates? Well, it's something we haven't really had to deal with in the last several months. We saw that uh, just looking at the 10-year treasury yield, we saw that peak around March 31st earlier this year, and it's been on a steady decline, I would say, since then. We're starting to see uh, rates start to move up a little bit more. Uh, They're at about, uh, about the 150 mark today, so still on a relative basis, on a historical basis, still very, very low, but they are moving upwards. I, I, you know, I, I think most still expect uh, the 10-year to finish the year uh, below that 2% level. Um, but, but I think that we do need to watch f- uh, those, those higher yields because it does start to challenge that whole narrative, uh, that, that whole Tina thesis. I think for now it's okay, but as we see that the yield start to move higher, it does, I think, speak maybe less, less so about the broader markets, but more about potential leadership. And, and so what I'm getting at there is on a day like today, we're actually seeing technology shares fall. And that's because they tend to have higher duration. They're a little bit more sensitive to rising rates. Uh, so what we look, uh, the way that we like to focus uh, our, our attention is on cyclical areas, areas that tend to provide a yield. So that they, they provide that shareholder yield either in the form of dividends or, or share buybacks. These can sustain higher yield pressure. And so they're likely to outperform as, as rates move higher. Back in July and August, you and I would talk and we'd talk about the importance of the September Federal Reserve meeting. Uh, maybe that's when we start seeing the taper start. The event came and left. Wasn't it, very dramatic, it, yeah. was it? You know, it, so... I think what's happened is, you know, back in in the summer, we were expecting September to be a a really big meeting uh, for the FOMC. And obviously, since then, we've seen a lot of the data move in the wrong direction. We've seen it disappoint. And so I I think specifically back to that August uh, jobs report that we got a few weeks ago. And so I think the Fed is thinking about this and saying, okay, we don't need to necessarily jump the gun. We can justify holding off a little bit more. But what we saw in last week's FOMC meeting is that they are trying to set expectations among investors that they are getting ready to taper. Certainly on the inflation end, we have seen, uh, we're, we're seeing infl- inflationary trends uh, move, move higher. And, and so there are pressures there. We're still waiting to see some uh, more signs of a recovery, more sustained recovery on the jobs market, but they seem pretty comfortable that, that the, the wheels are in motion there. And so what I, what I expect will happen is that in the November meeting, uh, very beginning of November, when the Fed next convenes, they will formally announce that taper, which is likely to begin 
probably in December. And so what they're doing is really just trying to be very, very clear about their communications, not do what they did in 2013 and, and, uh, and, and catch investors off guard. They don't want to see a so-called taper tantrum. So they're really trying to telegraph every move here. At the same time, they're trying to, they don't want to necessarily go out and, and, and say, we are definitely going to start tapering uh, or announce taper in November, start tapering in December, because they want to still provide some wiggle room in case the economy does underperform between now and then. Um, you know, specifically, I'm thinking about the next jobs report, the September jobs report. If we see another weak print then, then maybe that'll give the, the, the Fed something to think about. Also, we're, we're focused on the debt ceiling. Uh, and uh, that, that is, uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to be contending with this week. And so I think they want to still provide themselves with a little bit of wiggle room in case they need, do need to pivot or call an audible at the last second. After the Fed starts the tapering, which again is expected this year, we're going to start talking about higher interest rates and the Federal Reserve moving them up. How concerned are you that 2022, the Federal Reserve moves too quickly or the market's not ready for two moves or three moves? Are you yeah. worried that they're going to mismanage this? You know, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt for now. I, I think, I think, Everyone's worried, um, you know, that we're always worried about a potential policy error, but I think it's too early to worry about that. I mean, Jerome Powell has been very clear that there, it, there's, it's, it's a very different step in, in, in action to, to go out and raise rates from just tapering your, your bond purchases, your monthly bond purchases. I, I think of tapering bond purchases, what they're talking about doing right now is taking your foot off the gas pedal actually going out and raising interest rates off this, off this zero bound is like stepping on the brakes. Okay, so they're very, very different. I, right now, if you were to look at the dot plots, so, so the, um, the, the forward expectations for those 18 FOMC participants, where they expect the Fed funds rate, that target policy rate to be at the end of the, uh, the next few years, you would actually see that six of them, uh, and it's anonymous, uh, so, but six of those 18 members see one rate hike uh, by the end of, of 2022. Three members see two rate hikes by the end of next year, but that still leaves half of those participants that don't see any. And so I think it's, it's important not to, get, uh, not to get too into the weeds there. And, and you know, there's still, I, I think the fact that nine, nine see uh, rate actions and, and nine don't, it tells you that there's just a whole lot of uncertainty between now and then. So anything can really happen. Uh, and at the same time, that's 18 participants, only 12 of them get a vote. So we don't know who actually voted where within these dot plots. So I think it's important not to look at that and, and, and necessarily um, you know, take, take action based on the conclusions or takeaways from that, that so-called dot plot. Um, but uh, I, I think it is interesting. And I, I think as this, the Fed does start to unwind this policy, I, I, I definitely think that people are going to be talking about a policy error, but they've been talking about one for the last several months, too. There's certainly that camp of investors and, and economists who think that the Fed is, has already late and they're already behind the, the, the curve here. And, and uh, they're, they're starting to, to wean the economy off of this policy too late and the wheels are in motion for higher inflation. Interesting answer. Um, it seems like 2022 is going to be a big year for the Fed. They'll be on our conversation for quite a while. But 2022 is also going to be an election year. And this week seems to be kind of a, an agenda time for the Democrats and Republicans. We have the infrastructure spending bill, or we have the infrastructure bill, the spending bill, and the debt ceiling all to contend with. Drama out of Washington this week going to affect the stock markets. What are you seeing? I think it definitely could. I mean, we've been talking, and I, I, I don't think that we're the only ones saying it. This was uh, really gearing up to be the September to remember, right? And, and I think it's really, it all comes down to this week. And actually, uh, just today, we were expected to see this uh, a, a vote uh, in the House on the bipartisan infrastructure package. Uh, that was what uh, Speaker Pelosi had said, is that we're going we're gonna to take the vote. It already passed the Senate. We're, the House is going to vote on it on the 27th. Well, it appears that that vote is now being rescheduled for Thursday. Uh, they're going to talk about it today, but they're not actually going to vote on it on Thursday. And I think that uh, until Thursday, I think the takeaway there is that Speaker Pelosi doesn't have the votes among the Democrats to, to get this done. Uh, progressives are, are pushing back on this. They want to see it paired with this, uh, uh, with, with a bigger spending package of, of about three and a half trillion. So there's a lot of moving parts here. But I think in addition to this infrastructure bill, um, we are focused on the debt ceiling. 
And uh, it, it appears that uh, you know, the, the Republicans really want the Democrats to go it alone on this one because this can be done through budget reconciliation. They don't need any Republican support and Republicans don't really want to provide it because they're not in favor of raising this debt ceiling and they weren't in favor of a lot of spending over the last year. So uh, what we are more likely to see is a continuing resolution, which really kicks the can down the road, but, but just seeks to um, avoid or hopefully re uh, m mitigate the, the, the risk of a government shutdown. Um, and, and, and so it'll really just kick the can down the road until they can figure all this out. Um, but I, I think either way, it's gonna be a pretty exciting week on Capitol Hill. Thanks for joining us. Uh, that's Adam Phillips. He is EP Wealth's uh, Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy. He is a CDFP and a CFA. This was EP Wealth's Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Rob Black.